Hello and welcome to semi-final coverage of Grand Prix Richmond. I'm Brian Evan Marshall. I'm joined in the booth by Eduardo Sajgalek. And we are watching Noah Walker playing Death Shadow against Lucian Longlace playing lands. There's an exploration on turn one. Yeah, starting with prob probably the best start the lands that can have in terms of, well, what spells you want to cast outside of Life from the Loam. Um, just to kind of set the tone for this match, Ghost Quarter here, by the way, is basically wasteland um the the thing is i talked to oliver too um during the last quarterfinals and they were rooting for noah and we and they were discussing how stoneblade was a relatively bad matchup which noah ended up uh, being victorious in and i said i mean it's not that bad is it it's not like it's lands oh yeah lands is awful <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean Lu lucian was definitely rooting for noah to defeat joe in that quarterfinal he he defeated Ethan Embry, uh, and they, they were still playing at the time. Uh, Ethan Weber. Ethan Embry's an actor. <laughs> it's been a long weekend. Two-thirds of the way through. Yeah. I mean, Lucian is already starting with one of the reasons, uh, one of the worst cards for Death Shadow. But <laughs> Grove of the Burn Willows. Basically, you gain one. You will always gain one. <laughs> it's, just, <laughs> it's a good way to stop the Death Shadow deck from actually being able to cast its namesake. And it also um, helps use Punishing Fire. Now, Punishing Fire, not very good against Death Shadow, not that great against Gurmag Angler, and you might think, well, that's why, why would I care about this card then? Well, simply put, if you stop Death Shadow from being cast, yep. You can kill Delver and uh, move on with life. So Gamble, it looks like, was countered. A lot of alternate artwork from... Uh, yep, that was Gamble. Yeah, and, and here, this is already a really bad spot for Noah. Lucien is essentially a uh, Ghost Quarter slash Wasteland effect ahead. But Lucian really would have wanted that gamble to resolve. I mean, it always gets one card in the, these situations, which is Life from the Loam, that engine being really powerful. And <laughs> Noah knows which, which way is up in this matchup, and he gets rid of that Grove of the Birdwells with his own Wasteland. Yeah, and it's actually a really close call um, as to which one. Like, Grove is going to be an issue, but the thing is, Ghost Quarter... Uh, will get Noah's next mana source. So that was the other line Noah could have taken, which is get rid of Ghost Quarter to have a chance. Oh, wow, that's an old classic. That was from the first set I played Magic in, Judgment. It's actually really weird to see it in play. I think that's Riftstone Portal. In play, it only produces colorless mana. Where you really want it is in your graveyard, because then all your lands tap for green and white, including lands such as Maze of If, Dark Depths, that normally don't produce mana. So ideally, Riftstone Portal is a card you want in your graveyard in order to add mana with lands that have very high utility, but otherwise don't you know, produce um, that mana for your I spells. I guess he can, he can Ghost Quarter his own land here. It might. Yeah, that's a possibility. Especially if he finds a life from the loom at some point. Which I think he might have just done. He just drew a life from the loam. I, I think he might have. Uh, oh wow! Yeah, you're right. That's that. That is that draw is so powerful. Essentially, Noah can you know keep trying to force w without blue mana. There's not really much else. But once that life from the loam engine gets going, especially with exploration, Lu Lucian is just going to accumulate more and more mana while having additional wastelands of. Of wasteland effects, which means that Noah, at the best of time, basically, it's going to transform all of Noah's lands into the card Lotus Petal. <laughs> and when all of Noah's lands are Lotus Petals, I mean, that's going to be really hard for Noah to develop because all these blue cantrip decks, you know, they're trying to ponder, they're trying to brainstorm, they're trying to filter through the deck. All of this requires, you know, not much mana, but it does require mana. Yeah, and Lucian perfectly happy to kill this wasteland here with Ghost Quarter because if Riftstone Portal goes, well, yeah, I mean, is it that bad? And he's gonna get—he still gets to play two lands this turn. Yeah, I mean Lucian is super far ahead. Like the free damage per turn that uh, this Insectile Aberration is uh, doing will not do much in the face of Life from the Loam potentially dredging at some point. Maze of If. Um, Glacial Chasm is also the other one. Barbarian Ring, um, old classic in Lucian's deck. Um, and Or could just dredge a Punishing Fire, get it back with Grove. And yeah, there's a Gamble. Or, uh, or a Tabernacle at Pendril Vale. Yeah, Tabernacle also would work very well against Insectile Aberration. And it's just not going to deal six attacks here. I, I think it's pretty safe to say here that Lucian is going to take this one down. It, it, I, it would be very unlikely for Noah to be able to come back here. It's just going to take a little while. Uh, once Lucian has locked Noah out of the game, uh, he's going to assemble the combo. 
of Dark Depths in Thespian Stage, uh, making a copy of Dark Depths. If you haven't seen this before, uh, Dark Depths, 10 counters. When those counters get removed, uh, you make a 20-20, but that normally requires 30 mana. With Thespian Stage, you just copy it. The Dark Depth, They're both legendary lands then. The Dark Depths would go to the graveyard, and then you go, oh, wait, this Thespian Stage is a Dark Depths with no counters. I'll make a 20-20 flying indestructible creature. The plan for lands against these blue tempo decks, lock them out of the game. Once they're out, make a 2020 and end it in swift fashion. All right, so here we see Gamble from Lucian. Wh while we don't get to see the card that Lucian got, um, the highest chances for a utility land. Once you have life from the loam, you, you always get life first. And then after that, you start uh, looking for utility lands. I, I'm going to surmise that that Boduga Bog was just a card in Lucian's hand. Is that what got discarded? Is that what got discarded? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, you called it BDM Tabernacle at Pendrel Vale. <laughs> <laughs> That's the card that Lucian went to get, unless he really wanted that second second Tranquil Thicket. Wow. Oh, yeah. Sorry, the Tranquil Thicket was uh, brought back from the life from the loam. So yeah, the, the Tabernacle, and yeah. it's a way to make sure that no one can uh, get any frets going, since yeah. between Tabernacle at Pendrel Vale. And um, Wasteland, Recursion, there's no way for Noah to stick a creature. So th this, this game is over. So here we see Life from the Loam. Going to get cast. Going to pick up a handful of lands. Yeah, because even if Noah had like a, an amazing hand, say, like with Free Force of Wills, and was able to just protect the Delver, you can't protect against the Tabernacle. Again, one of those cards that didn't produce land. <laughs> Here's Bajuka Bog. Here's Tabernacle at Pendrel Vale. By the way, Bajukabog, my most most loathed card in the history of Magic. What what happened to you? I, I people played a Bajukabog against me, and I was upset. <laughs> I hate it. Yeah, but it's a very popular legacy card. You know, when you're playing Knight of the Reliquary and uh, of course. Gamble, Life from the Loam, it's a perfect card to have as uh, just main deck graveyard hate. Also, the lands player plays four crop rotation. So against Reanimator, you have this really neat way to disrupt them even on turn one. Noah, really not sure how he's going to be able to keep permanence in play. Would not be surprised to see him consider conceding pretty soon. I mean, you can consider conceding, but I mean, these rounds are untimed. There's just nothing that Noah can really do here to make headway or progress. Um, at some point, Lucian can double Wasteland, even a Fetchland, or uh, port tapping the, the Fetchland and then Wastelanding it. There's just nothing that Noah can really do at this point. The, the, the lock is in place. There hasn't been enough pressure, and, and Noah can't do anything. At some point, Lucian will just make a 20-20 and end, end, end everything. Well, there is Dark Depths. He's got special... Oh, he's gonna, he, has to use, he has his own dice that he's brought for the 10 counters, but he has to use the coverage dice here. They've got their own case. And right. now he casts another copy of Gamble. Right, and Noah could interact with this, but um, it doesn't really matter, let's be honest. <laughs> I'd love to tell you that Noah has a path to victory, but no, it doesn't. It's, this is just the, land, the lands that kind of put the lock on. Uh, probably here you gamble for Fespian Stage to kind of set up Lethal. Um, and yeah, um, that's, that's really going to be mostly it. I, I guess Lucian this turn is going to... Could I ever play this Fespian Stage? Um, you know, end the game in a faster fashion, or simply get back Rishidin Port, tap Bloodstained Mire, Wasteland it, and yeah, I, I think Lucian basically is just aiming to end this game relatively fast, and yeah, that yep. was, I'm, I'm pretty certain that was the card that was searched he with He discards Gamble. the Thespian stage. Right, so we're going to Life from the Loam. I mean, Noah could have a counter spell here, but it's going to be really hard. Um, I mean, Force of Will is basically it since Dark Depths and Tabernacle produce mana from Whiffstone Portal. So Spell Piercer Days are not going to do it. So there's the Thespian stage. Yeah, and Passes and the turn. Yeah. Again, remember, Riftstone Portal in the graveyard allows Tabernacle at Pendleville and Dark Depths to tap for mana. So That's just not fair. Yep. <laughs> and Noah Walker scoops it up. Essentially, no permanence. No, uh, yeah. and, and, and Lucian is going to, you know, summon the Merit Lage from the ice and win on his uh, next turn. Uh, I can tell you, I was talking to Lucian in between uh, the quarterfinals, and he's someone who played on his first Pro Tour 2006 at Pro Tour Honolulu. Wow, okay. Uh, and That's a good, that was a good Pro Tour to go to. It was a good Pro Tour. He, he referred to the Craig Jones Lightning Helix, and, you know, Mark, Mark Herberholtz won that with the Heasy Street deck. 
But uh, he said, you know what? And then I, like, my life changed. I got a job out of state, sold my cards, stopped playing Magic. Didn't play Magic for 12 years. 12 years brings us to, to 2018. Yes. He uh, went to uh, a couple Grand Prix earlier in the year, uh, managed to uh, get together, get a couple pro points, uh, qualified for pro the Pro Tour in Richmond uh, by winning an online PTQ. And, uh, you know, he's been, he's been putting a, a nice run together here. Yeah. You know, someone, it's kind of cool to see. Uh, to be fair, he's put a nice deck together. He that has. And this is, this is actually a new legacy deck for him. His, go, his beloved legacy deck was in fact. Oh, really? Okay. Yes. And then when Gitaxi and Probe got banned in the format, he's like, well, I, I just don't feel like this deck is good enough anymore. And uh, he had enough you know, sweet cards from his collection that he was able to uh, put together this lands deck, and this has become his new uh, deck of choice. Yeah, and yeah, I mean, and when I talk to a lot of players about their, you know, Grixis control and uh, Death Shadow, they're like, what's your worst match? They're like, lands, lands is just horrific. There's not, not much I can do. Um, and, and you can kind of see how that matchup is really punishing. The, the one matchup that, it's worth noting, the matchup that Lucian does want to avoid is Miracles. That yeah. matchup is horrific for lands. All your, all the good plans we talked about, wastelanding your opponent out, um, doesn't work against Miracles, too many basics. Um, trying to make it Dark Depths, you still have sh Swords of Plowshares and Terminus. It's just a nightmare of a matchup. And what's the other side of the bracket? A Miracle's Miracle. I was going to say, if Lucian wins this uh, semifinal, it would require an actual literal miracle for him to not play against Miracles. <laughs> well, it will happen. And then it's just a question of, can he pull it off? If again, if he wins, but he is ahead one game, and Noah Walker, though, really competent player, you know, gold level pro, um, just oh, tremendous, just, tremendous you know. legacy player. Someone who really has uh, made his bones on the uh, Star City legacy circuit. Yeah, and transitioned into the the professional circuit, and really been amazing at that. But yeah, let's set the stage for these post sport games. Uh, Lucian probably not going to change much. These two chokes are very good uh, since everything that Noah puts in play is an island in terms of his mana base. Uh, so the two chokes are going to be really good. Uh, you could, um, I believe the drops of honey are okay for a matchup like this. They allow to deal with creatures that are re at a really cheap cost. Um, I don't believe uh, we'll see Molten Vortex, but we may. It does deal with Dollar, but it doesn't deal with the big frets. Uh, Sphere Resistance also relatively good, and you might board, he might board in a tracker or two, but remember he doesn't want to board too much. The thing is, your, his deck is already engineered to beat the Death Shadow decks. So he wants to beat enough that he doesn't lose to the card's Surgical Extraction, since Noah is definitely boarding in all three copies of that between the Life from the Loam, the uh, Dark Depths combo, and the Punishing Fire. But so Lucian will bring some alternative win conditions in, but he doesn't want to change his deck too much is the most likely scenario. Our side, Noah... Is going to board in these Diabolic Thedix as an out to Merit Lage. Um, probably him to Turak can sometimes work, but usually the lands deck tends to play its spells fast enough and Life from the Loam recoups card advantage, so him is a little mediocre. Probably going to board out most of the removal, like Snuff Out and uh, Fail Push, Dismember, not the cards you really want. So probably going to see those free Surgical Extractions being the main thing that Noah can bring to the table. And I think that's going to be the, the card we want here from uh, Noah's side. That said, there's not too much of a change uh, post-board between... Like, the two decks don't morph enough for me to say anything, but Lucian is extremely advantaged in this matchup. Even, like, a card like Grove of the Burn Vuel is making Noah gain one life and making the premier threat of the deck, again, potentially irrelevant. I, I honestly have to call this one for Lucian, but, you know, magic can happen, and uh, Noah's best card is actually a card I did not mention, but that we saw in Game 1, which was those two Wastelands. If Noah can... Wasteland at key moments or have a Wasteland to stop a Dark Depths while putting pressure, there is a chance to get there, especially with Noah on the play. But it's going to be really difficult to win for Noah to win two games. He just needs to apply a tempo push at exactly the right moments when Lucian really needs a key spell or ability to resolve and push for damage at that moment. And yeah, it's going to come down to just pushing and being threatening at the right times. Well, you see the players getting ready here for game two. And again, I t as I said, Lucian was like, yeah, I'd rather play Noah. 
than play yeah. against the deck with swords or the deck with Jace or the deck with so Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and like to talk about the texture of the matchup. You saw in game one that Lucian's goal locked down first, win second. And while Noah is going to probably board in these Diabolic Tedics, they're not very good against the lock plan. They're very good if you're putting pressure, forcing Lucian to make a 2020 and then applying it. But if Lucian gets to Wasteland lock Noah out of the game, uh, there's n almost nothing that Noah can do to come back. Since, as we saw, Tabernacle would come down, Noah would have no creatures, and then we're done. I, I can tell you that uh, Andrew Cuneo is up a game in the Miracles uh, mirror over there. So, um, you know, I know that uh, both Reed and Marshall had joked about going to see Mission Impossible uh, during the semifinals here. Uh, and then had said, oh, we were just kidding. We're actually going to watch the first three Mission Impossibles <laughs> during the semifinals here. But maybe they need to hurry back. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. I'm sure they haven't gone too far. <laughs> Should we spoil the movies for them to make the experience less enjoyable? <laughs> Yeah, someone was wearing a rubber mask. Um, <laughs> can also tell you, uh, just to give you a little bit of an update on the player of the year race. Mm -hmm. uh, at the end of day one in standard, everybody chasing Reed Duke, which is Luis Salvato and Seth Manfield, 8-0. <laughs> yeah, great. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure Reed is thrilled about this situation. Oh, there you go. So uh, here is your race for the player of the year. Seth Manfield, 8-0 in standard, heading into day two. Reed Duke, obviously, 11-3-1. Cannot advance his point total to chase down Seth. He's one point behind. Luis Salvato, 8-0 in standard, going into day two. I want to so. see those two play for top eight. Well, I, or, I, or play in the quarters. I, I have mean. a feeling we're going to see a lot of them tomorrow in feature match coverage, probably when we get here in the morning. Let's take a look at uh, these players are still shuffling up. I can give you a little bit of sense of who did what. I, I, I guess Lucian is uh, mulliganing, but yeah. Yeah, here, here we go. You can see some of the players who have gone 8-0. Oliver Chu, we saw him playing against Matt Severa in the Constructed Master Showdown. Uh, Oliver Chu did win that one. Uh, so a handful of eight O's. Christian Hawk, a German player who uh, he was. I, I can't remember what level he was chasing. I f I think he was chasing platinum by coming to Richmond, and it's great to see him at eight O because he's not chasing a you know a race. He's trying to get to the top of the pro status that he you know that he can be. So seven players there. You see a, a handful of familiar names uh, down at seven and one. Forty three players advancing, and then you saw all the X and twos. There were you know some hundred and twenty odd whatever it was, players, maybe... <laughs> An intimate day two field. Yes, yes. Just sure. me and a couple of... You know, it's like planning a wedding, just me and 200 friends. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We are underway. Noah Walker leads things off with a polluted Delta. And Lucian Longlace has Grove of the Burn Willows, plays a Mox Diamond, pitches a Rishon in port to it, and now if he follows suit from what I've seen him do uh, in some of the other rounds... Oh, well, he's got another Mox Diamond. Yeah, he, it looks like he's going all in on this tireless tracker. He's got a Taiga. Does he have... I, I, I mean, I, I believe I saw Tireless Tracker. A Life tracker. from the Loam? Yeah, he does. He, his hand is Life from the Loam Tireless Tracker. And it's kind of difficult to counter a Life from the Loam. Because even if he counters it here, then he's got to counter it again next turn. And this just plays into Lucian's uh, long-term plan. So, wow. Great oh. turn one from Lucian. Ends up with three mana sources in play. And then gets two more lands back in. But Noah Walker fires off the surgical extraction. And he is going to get Life from the Loam out of Lucian's deck. Right. And Life from the Loam is the priority premium target for surgical extraction. Wow. Because... Lucian's best plan is to lock Noah out of the game without the uh, ability to recur Wasteland. It is possible for Noah to, to you know, Lucian's Wasteland do not come back. They, you know, you use them once, you're good. But they're not coming back. So the fact is Noah can start generating mana because Noah's spells are very cheap. Even one land is enough for Noah to start developing his game plan. So getting rid of these life from the loams, this recursion, this endless end card advantage engine is really powerful here. Wow, and all four of them are gone. Noah also gets to just take a long, lingering look over exactly how Lucian is sideboarded for this matchup. And really think about what other cards he might want to worry about, what he might want to target if he snap casters back a surgical extraction at some point later in the game. Yeah, I mean, I mean, uh, I, I know we saw uh, Snapcaster Mage as 
a card that uh, Sam Pardee had as tech, but uh, no, no, was oh, not. Oh, no, was not no, playing. No, oh, right. sorry about that. It's okay. Uh, it's it's a really key interaction that you would have seen more from the the Miracles deck, and that we'll probably see if Lucian wins this match. Uh, coming in post board is Snapcaster Surgical. Is also one of the reasons why Miracles versus Lands is such a bad matchup for the Lands deck. Especially, I mean, it gets even worse post board. It's bad pre board. It's worse post board. And now Wasteland's going to take out Grove of the Burn Willows, and that's going to keep. Lucian from being able to uh, play his tireless tracker and get a clue this turn. He can still play the land first, get the tireless tracker, but it does set him back in terms of recouping some of that card disadvantage from those uh, boxes. Right, yeah. Like, when Wasteland is also preventing, as you mentioned, the draw of a card, and that's pretty important, especially because Noah is not going to really have access to too much removal. Interestingly, though, the other thing... Tireless tracker cost free. That would tap out Lucian. And if Noah has a daze at that point, that would be backbreaking. But I see a Diabolic Edict in Noah's hand and a land. So I think that Noah's plan here is probably going to just be... Um, I mean, we might get a land fetch at some point. But, you know, at some point, untap Diabolic Edict, your Tireless Tracker. Because Lucian is so low on cards. And Noah knows that one of those is a Taiga, so it's not very high impact. I think here... Actually, Noah's in a situation where he can be ahead. Uh, Lucian went for what is quite a bit of card disadvantage with these Mox Diamonds. I mean, the Life from the Loam recouped that, but losing the Life from the Loams means that there's no recursive engine. If you get rid of the Tireless Tracker, then Lucian has no card advantage and source and repeat uh, recursion. And then Noah can take over. This is the thing. This is how Noah wins the game, is cutting these recursive sources of card advantage. And once that's done, fret, 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 kill, kill, kill. We see him going for the Diabolic Edict here. That's going to take out the Tireless Tracker. Yeah. What I really like about Diabolic Edict, while, again, if he gets locked out of the game, it's not going to help against a Merit Lage, it's really nice that it doubles against the card advantage of a potential Tireless Tracker. Yeah. So here we see Richard and Port being used on the Watery Grave during Noah's upkeep. Still two uh, Mox Diamonds untapped for Lucian. Somebody said, why is Richard and Port an unfair card? I don't understand. And um, while it may cost two to activate to stop one land, the fact that you have that option and can use it for mana made it one of the most egregious cards to ever hit standard at the time. <laughs> it was actually a stalwart in block as well. It's just... There, there was actually, I think, a deck that literally just boomeranged all your lands plus Port, right? That was horrible. So No Walker fetches up another Watery Grave. Goes down to ten here. He's got two mana available to him. And then we're going to see a Death Shadow. It's a 3-3. Three, three. Yep. And, and he has a Gurmag Angler, and he's just going to delve away his graveyard and put Death Shadow and Gurmag Angler into play. Although, now I see an interesting card in Lucian's hand here, and I'm curious how that's going to play out. Drop, Drop of, of Honey. honey. Yeah. 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 Drop of Honey um, was actually time-shifted at some point as the card. So you might know Drop of Honey as the card Porphyry Notes. Um, from Planar Chaos. Um, there's some... This is a very ancient card. <laughs> this is from Arabian Nights. And he's going to let Noah read it, which may not uh, fully convey the oracle text of the card. Right. But essentially what Drop of Honey does is at, at the beginning of Lucian's upkeep, uh, the creature with the lowest power is just destroyed. That It's actually relatively close to the oracle text. And when there are no creatures in play, um, you have to sacrifice the, the Drop of Honey. Um, but yeah, this is basically going to act as a double removal spell. And if Noah enacts another fret, it will also take it. So now Noah has to decide, do I, what do I do here? Do I, I mean, Noah is going to attack no matter what here, obviously. And is going to lose a creature. But then the question when you have one is, do you make an additional fret knowing that both would go away? trying to deal lethal damage or do you wait for the drop of honey to go and that's can, that can be and that's why that card can be powerful is sometimes you have one fret you decide that the point of the second one is going to be very dangerous so your opponent untaps with you having no creatures in place so you untap make a fret and it basically drop of honey gives you two turns it's slow initially it doesn't remove the creature right away but the fact is once it's kind of done all its work you get one extra turn so you buy back that turn down the, down the line and that gives you one more turn for to draw a maze of if some uh, glacial chasm, something of importance that allows you to to move the game in your direction. I know Walker's trying to figure out what he wants to do with this ponder right now. 
Yeah, and if you're just joining us for the top eight, it's been a flurry of ponders, brainstorms, preordains, just like you love it in Legacy. <laughs> I've been shocked, actually, by how little we've seen of Chalice for one. Okay. That's fair. Um, I think it's because we focused a lot on, you know, players doing well to start with. And a lot of these are some of the top players in the game. And, and those players tend to favor, in Legacy, especially Brainstorm decks. Because they give you more options as the game goes on. They allow you to adapt and be flexible. And uh, the top players in the game like their decks to be flexible. Which the Chalice decks usually aren't as much. They can be the Chalice decks can be really powerful, and there is play to them. Um, it's just that there's less about you know you can mana screw a lot easier because you're not you know essentially stacking your deck every turn. Oh, Street Wraith here, good pickup. Yeah, Street Wraith is gonna cycle. It's gonna drop Noah to eight, which is now gonna you know give plus two plus two to the to the uh, Death Shadow and another copy of Ponder here for Noah Walker. It looks like he plays two, Underground C. Yeah, it looks like two Brainstorms and a fetch land. So currently Noah would attack Lucian down to 10. Then you would lose the Gurmag Angler. It's going to be hard for Noah to lose the requisite 5 life, but it is possible. Brainstorm into something, into that fetch land plus let's just say another street wave would do the trick so they were tied and he chose death he ch chose to kill the death shadow yeah that's the thing you destroy the creature with the least power so death shadow it, no one would have been able to get there but with the creatures being at the same power it's a lot harder <coughs> oh another gurmag angler that's that is an excellent draw with the graveyard being this stocked uh, no one can attack for five, play the second angler, lose it, and then attack for five again. It's a really tough call since if Lucian draws something like a maze of if, no one is, is in extreme <laughs> trouble. Yes. Uh, and may decide I would do want to wait a turn, but I think here the it's correct to put a lot of pressure because stage uh, means that you can copy a, a maze of ifs and have two. So at that point, um, you realize I'm actually probably just losing to maze down the line. So I'm just going to go for broke and uh, make the second fret here. All right. So Noah Walker makes a second copy of Gurmag Angler. He also plays a Bloodstained Mire. He's going to lose the Angler on upkeep to the Drop of Honey. And can Lucian find an answer to the remaining Gurmag Angler? There's a Dark Depths. H how about just a winning 2020? Wow. He's got the Thespian stage. Although here we have a, uh, an interesting scenario, and this is where I would like the Oracle text on something like Drop of Honey, because I believe it does destroy. So one f if, if, if I am correct in this, because it destroys rather than you have to sacrifice, um, one play that Noah could have made was attack with Gurmag Angler, you're forced to block with the Merit Lage, and then there's only one creature in play, you have to destroy it. But because it's indestructible, I believe, unless the Oracle text no, proves yeah. otherwise, that the 2020 would still be in play. So Noah can't make that play. I mean, that's poor yeah. free nodes, which should be the same. And it does say destroy. So, yeah. Actually, that's a really incredible combo that I did not consider. Drop of Honey with Merit Lage means that Drop of Honey will always stick around. There, you know someone's serious about their land deck when they bring their own Merit Lage token to the party. There's the 2020. It's indestructible. Yeah. Do it before Noah can draw into a wasteland. Since you can't really respond to wasteland coming to play, it's a land, and once that's in play, well, you're not making that token. So you might as well just do it right away. I mean, you can let Noah untap, but before Noah has a chance to uh, make a land drop is certainly when you would want to make the token. Yeah, this game was really close. I mean... No one can still win. It just requires drawing the right card. <laughs> and I think the really right... needs to see a Diabolic Edict right here, right now. That second Diabolic Edict, I believe, is, is what we're looking for. It's the one top deck. That, that would be an incredible draw. I actually don't... I, I don't believe there's another card. So it comes down to just getting that second Diabolic Edict and winning with that. That, that would be an incredible win from Noah. Drawing the one outer. 
Okay. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Lucian cuts very trepidatiously there. Brainstorm. Yeah, oh, oh boy. Okay, we get we get some looks. Just one. Just two. Three. Oh. Is it diabolic Dedict? He's checking. I think if he had Diabolic Dedict, it would have cast it. Lays down his hand. Lucian Longlace into the finals here at Grand Prix Richmond. Assembles the combo despite getting his life from the loams surgically extracted at the end of turn one. So pretty, pretty crazy uh, turn of events there. And Lucian is able to advance to the finals over, you know, legacy veteran Noah Walker. Yeah, and, and there, the drop of honey and giving the time to Noah, uh, sorry, to Lucian to, to take over, drawing into the combo, and the 2020 takes over. But yeah, I'm, I'm kind of excited to see what kind of horrible and confusing board state we're going to see in this Miracles matchup. But yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to expect a, at least a lot of lands from each side, and then we'll see which player has adjacent play. If it's both, it's going to be maybe not as gritty as the Grixis Control Mirror is. Oh, okay. Wow, wow we are... Okay, this was a lot walk. simpler than I believed as a boy state would you, be. You Nothing know, in play. You know how we sometimes watch the time walk matches on like slightly faster speed? I think uh, Marshall and uh, Reed are going to need to watch Mission Impossible a little faster here. Yeah. Because we they are get the already music? on yeah. to game three. Do they get the music while they watch it fast? Does that work? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, if either player has learned that Lucian won on the other side of the bracket, they understand. I, there's a very, very, very high chance that the winner of this game is going to be the Grand Prix champion. Because the matchup in the finals for both of these players is exceptional. They, they both are already favored. And... Yeah, it's just going to come down who who can take this one down. If I was to say which one Lucien would prefer to face as uh, Brad Mulligans here, um, neither player... Uh, yeah, Cunio has two main deck. They both have two main deck back to bases. That's just awful news already um, for Lucien. I think they're both <laughs> relatively bad news. There's not too much, I guess, uh, looking at sideboards. I guess there's a rest in peace in Brad's and a Caracas, so Brad would be a worse matchup, just marginally so. But overall, anyways, I, I would say this is not what Lucian wants to see as the other side of the bracket. Still, I mean, Lucian won, gets to the finals, and could pull off a miracle. Or a 19 miracle, in this case. <laughs> right, an anti-miracle. Is that, is that a thing, an anti-miracle? I mean, there's anti-heroes, right? So. All right, so Brad decides to finally keep six cards. And we are off to the races island for Andrew Cuneo. And Amon Cat was my favorite silt format of all time. <laughs> and uh, here we see Plus. Brad playing very quickly with uh, a fetch land for a preordain that gets flusterstormed. Yeah. Yeah, and it's okay to trade uh, Flusterstorm for a Preordain against an opponent and Mulligan. Since they're usually looking to complete... When you Mulligan in a matchup like this, you're looking to complete something that's missing. And that's why you see uh, Andrew trading here. He also has access to Snapcaster Mage, and it's a way to generate card advantage, say, on turn free. You go Flusterstorm, and then on turn free, you get to go Snapcaster Flusterstorm. So Brad plays a Flooded Strand, passes the turn, and we see a Predict from Andrew Cuneo at the end of the turn. He's going to target Brad, see an arena disenchant, go into the graveyard, and uh, not the card Andrew named. And he <laughs> Not the card Andrew <laughs> named. You actually, it's like, it's like horse, you have to call it, you have to say, I name arena disenchant. <laughs> arena disenchant. I'm actually, it's actually interesting that Andrew uh, targeted uh, the top of Brad's library, since cards in graveyard are actually a relevant resource in a matchup like the Miracles Mirror, so I'm kind of surprised Andrew decided to target Brad considering there was no card manipulation to speak of. Because you would want a random card in your graveyard given the choice in most circumstances. And they're also both fetching basic lands, which is interesting. Both play back to basics, but this is not the matchup where you want the card. So I'm trying to figure out why they would uh, fetch so many basics compared to trying to get their dual land. And I think the main reason is that uh, sometimes you want to get the dual land later and leave it in the deck because you have a very stringent mana requirement or you have a fetch land you know, that can only get... Say you want white mana, 
but there's no planes left in the deck or, you're, or you have a, something like a polluted delta. That's what it is. It allows you to make sure that you're keeping your fetch for a white source later down the line. Now here we might see that play you talked about earlier. Uh, Brad Bonin is playing a Vendillion click. At the end of Andrew's turn, he does have the option to snap Caster Mage. He's not going to do it. Yeah, I mean, you can't snap Fluster here, and the hand is relatively yeah. redundant. Uh, I mean, the Vanilla Clique is probably going to take either... Well, actually, there's a lot of interesting cards here. Uh, search for Escanta, uh, considering there's no real answer to that card. Neither player is playing Wasteland, and Brad doesn't really have an answer to um, a Transform Search for Escanta. And I think with the redundancy of two Snapcasters plus Jace being expensive, it's potentially going to be the card that's taken here. Um, that said, Andrew's hand is very loaded. The other option is this. Keep it all because, I mean, at least I know what I'm facing and I right. can play around it. And it looks like that's what Brad Bonin chose to do. Sacrifices his Flooded Strand now. So you know, get a fourth land. Fetches a Plains. Two Plains, two Islands in play for him. And, I mean, this is already a precursor of the finals match. The fact is, they both have tons of basics, so nice try, Wasteland deck. Plays his fifth land, another island, and here comes Monastery Mentor for Brad Bonin. Yeah, and, and this is a very dangerous card. And now, P Ponder is going to make a Monk token. Yeah, Brad is pulling ahead really quickly here. Um, the thing is... Um, basically, Monastery Mentor, there's not many answers at this point. Uh, you, you lose a lot of the sorts of Plowshares and Terminus because, you know, you're, tr you're playing a Control Mirror. There, usually you keep one Terminus or two in just because of these situations or a sorts of Plowshares. So once, but once the Mentor's in play, there's not many answers to it. I mean, you could go Jace Bounce, but that's going to put Andrew in a position with a Jace at two that will easily die to what's in play. So, Brad, really putting everything in play and, and putting on a quick clock. I mean, we talk a lot of, like about the Miracle's Mirror in general in Legacy as, you know, a really grindy and long affair, but sometimes it's all about getting that mentor in play and pushing it to, to victory. All right, Andrew Cuneo breaks the flood of strength. He goes and gets the first dual land of the, of the game. He gets a Tundra. Yeah, and, and they only both play uh, one Tundra. They really want to make sure that... They, well, they have as many, non, uh, ba as many basics as possible. A Andrew has Supreme Verdict here, and yep. he's going to clean up the board. He's going to get rid of the Vendillion Click. He's going to get rid of the Monastery Mentor. He's going to get rid of the Monk, and says, let's start over. And that's going the other way. I believe that Supreme Verdict was a draw from Andrew since he didn't have it earlier with Vendillion Click. And it's, yeah, that's the, that, this is the sweeper you want just because it's uncounterable. And now Andrew's going to pull ahead. That was a two-for-one. Brad was already low on resources, and Andrew's hand is stacked. So now he's going to attempt to stick that search for Escanta. Yeah, and this is just... this is That card, once it flips, is a horror show in the mirror. Essentially, not ju not even you know the fact that you get a spell every turn. That's already bad enough. But just the fact that it's an additional land in the control mirror means that you're more likely to try to win counter wars by playing more Snapcasters at the right time. I it's just horrible for, for Brad. But yeah, here, Snapcaster Disenchant is going to be the aim. Especially with, but with Andrew having Island Island Tundra up, probably will go for something like Snapcaster Flusterstorm. Uh, but has to consider if Brad has a way to deal with it. Spell Snare is a clean answer to Snapcaster Mage. Okay, Flusterstorm your Spell Snare. Right, and at this point, Andrew cannot uh, Snapcaster Flusterstorm, so the Disenchant is going to work, and Brad's going to put himself out of losing to that Search for Scant. All right, gets in with the Snapcaster Mage. Andrew has a Snapcaster Mage of his own. Looks like he's going to ponder first, though. Yeah. I mean, this chip damage does matter to some degree, um, but it'll be very easy for Andrew to trade, uh, to trade off Snapcaster Mages down the line. I like the term chip damage. Chip damage, way, yeah. yeah. Yeah, just come in, come in, come in. Yeah. The, the, there was a deck that was exactly that. All they did was chip damage. So there was a 2-2, two, two, and you didn't care. And there was another 2-2, two, two, and you didn't really care. And then there was another 2-2 two, two and some counter magic, and you were like, oh, wait, I'm dead. What, what's going on? 
but but that's what happens a lot and that's how miracles wins a lot now especially with the ban of sensei's divining top is just going for these kind of snapcaster beatdown plans you know you control the game your opponent really can't do anything and then you're oh i, I can attack for four turn and that's good enough i mean we've seen this countless times in legacy modern snapcaster mage that two one body acting as a win condition so andrew plays snapcaster at the end of the turn flashes back his predict and we'll see who he targets. I think himself, and he's going to name it correctly since he uh, predicted. Yep, names island, draws two cards. The, the ponder, uh, you know, set it up. The, one of the core combos. We saw some other Miracles lists in the tournament play uh, for accumulated knowledge, but uh, predict was a really interesting piece of technology that got discovered. Ponders to play for Andrew. He's still on five lands here, both of these players. Yeah. And at this point, it may look like it's roughly the same board. You know, five lands, both with uh, Snapcaster Mage in play. But Andrew is uh, ahead, even though the life totals are not in his favor, just because I think there's at least an additional card in hand, if not two. Um, and Andrew's cards, are we also saw them. They're very powerful. And I don't believe that um, Brad has necessarily the tools to, to fight here. Yeah, so we trade. Not, yeah, trade. He's, he's done with... Uh all that chipping. And now we get another predict. And again, also set up. By Ponder, yeah. And yeah, Brad, you can see Brad shaking his end. This is too many two-for-ones. And he's like, I don't want that Flusterstorm, but I would like these next two cards. Thank you very much. And he is burying Brad here in card advantage. Yeah, there's another predict. Ooh. Here is counterbalance. If, if you wanted a way to get... We've seen a lot of two-for-ones and little grinds and advantages. This is different. Um, once this is in play, one player is heavily favored since it really goes from one-for-one, two-for-one, three-for-one. It really accumulates because both players... Well, they're, they're playing the mirror match. And with Brainstorm and Ponder, you can stack your deck in such a way that you're going to most likely get spells. And this is why you see Brad... I mean, you have to force this, but there's way too much counter magic. And Hard backup casting Andrew. force of will, and that gets spell pierced by Andrew. And Andrew is just is in pulling play. away from this game. He's got a Jason hand. I mean, wow. Oh, and here's Council's judgment. Yeah, there's not many freeze in the Miracles deck, so counterbalance rarely gets there. But Andrew has his own Council's judgment, so Brainstorm is going to essentially act as a counter spell. I mean, it's a one mana dismiss. Right, he's going to brainstorm in response. He's going to get to look at three cards. Put uh, wow. Two cards back down on top of his deck. One of them will be Council's Judgment. He'll. Th I've, I've never seen Ancestral Recall be. I mean, it's literally drawing four cards. You counter the Council's Judgment, you get rid of two cards you don't necessarily want. It, it's not quite drawing four cards. I think that was a little ambitious. But, it, you know, it's an extraordinarily powerful effect. One blue draw card, counter target spell. That's a really good card, right? I mean, yeah, you play absolutely. the constructed effect for four. And now I think we're going to see Jace finally hit the board. Yeah, I mean, the way Andrew navigated this is Andrew understood that his cards were very high in power. So one of the ways Andrew could lose was simply to try to tap out into Brad and Brad gets his own Jace and starts pulling ahead. So Andrew took, played this very slowly, cagely, waited until it was a very safe moment. He may not even play the Jace here. He still has like access to a lot of action. There's no real rush to play um, Jace the Mind Sculptor here. He could, though. Especially with counterbalance, there's a lot of backup here. And once Jace is in play and Andrew untaps, he's going to be pulling further and further ahead. All right, well, there is Jace. Another force of will, uh, this time pitching a blue card. Yeah, I mean, even if Jace gets countered uh, and counterbalance doesn't do its job, I guess you can still predict. I mean, predict would work anyway since Andrew knows the top card from Brainstorm. Yeah, he could also Snapcaster Flusterstorm here. Uh, Jay's Force Snapcaster Flusterstorm would be exactly four spells. Um, yeah. So he reveals Snapcaster off counterbalance. That misses. Yeah, so here you can Snapcaster Flusterstorm the Force of Will, um, which would protect the Jace. Here comes the Snapcaster, as you predicted. And Andrew knows that uh, yeah. Brad cannot respond with a uh, Snapcaster of his own just because Snapcaster's on top. 
Once Counterbalance is in play, actually Snapcaster Mage uh, becomes a really bad card because you need the top card to not be a 2 or the cost of what you're flashing back, which is usually a 1, i.e. most of the deck. Wow. And Andrew Cuneo is in full control here. You may have heard of an old deck, an old one of the original control decks, Cuneo Blue. <laughs> He's been playing these control decks for a very, very long time. This is where he feels most comfortable playing Magic. And he, I mean, he top... What was it, top four right next weekend and yeah Brad, Brad knows the writing on the wall uh, while this is an untimed finals uh, or semi-finals in this case he understands I'm never getting there the counterbalance the Jace it's just over and you wow. know still super performs by Brad I was very impressed with his play on camera I had a chance to play against him in Providence on format I think in standard it was a tiny bit less comfortable than he appeared to be in Legacy because in Legacy he looked very comfortable and understood what his game plan was but Cuneo took over there you take a look at our bracket, and you get a preview of our finals. Andrew Cuneo playing Miracles against Lucian. I'm going to need a Miracle. Long Lace playing Lands. The matchup is not good for him. Uh, we'll see how it plays out, though. We'll have Marshall Sutcliffe and Reed Duke in the booth with the call for the finals coming up right after these messages.